Chapter 3 Harvey Carrignan did not remain single long. In early 1972, he was 44 years old, and bitter over the number of years of his life that had been swallowed up behind bars. He was not exactly what most women were looking for in a Prince Charming. He was actually an unattractive man. His hairline had fallen back from his peculiarly domed forehead. He had a receding chin and a deep scar over one eye. He looked years older than his true age, with his skin deeply lined and bags and wrinkles beneath his eyes. His customary expression was still a glowering frown, and to smile, he had to make a concentrated effort. But Harvey was a big, well-built man and he affected sideburns that grew almost down to his dimpled chin. He could be charming when the occasion called for it, although he was also known for his occasionally blatant crudeness when he approached women. He could turn his charm off and on, like a light switch. He hid his temper well when he met Alice Johnson and gave her the full impact of his charismatic persona. Alice was taken with him from the beginning, but then... Alice was a most vulnerable woman. Alice Johnson had just been divorced, too, and she found single life miserable. Like many newly divorced women, Alice needed proof that she was still attractive to men. If she should find someone else who cared for her enough to marry her, that would prove to her ex-husband that she was still a woman to be reckoned with. Alice was rather a plain woman in her early thirties, but she had a trim figure and long brown hair to her shoulders. Even so, she was not deluged with invitations from men. Perhaps it was because she was not good at witty conversation. She was naive and gullible, and her education had ceased when she finished the eighth grade. She worked cleaning houses, and occasionally cleaning furniture stores after business hours. As a cleaning woman, she had few opportunities to meet men. Her social life was worse than dull. It was almost non-existent. Alice started going to a small cafe just across the street from the Save More gas station, or to a neighborhood tavern, the Meet Me There tavern, which was next door to the cafe. And there, in the tavern, she did indeed meet someone. She met Harvey Carrignan. When she met Harvey, she was impressed. By this time, he had managed to lease a Save More gas station from the Time Oil Company, and Alice thought he owned it. Business was brisk, and Harvey assured her it would get even better as gas shortages increased. She thought she had found herself a nice, hard-working, middle-aged man. Alice owned her own home at 135th and 20th Northeast, which Harvey moved into. Alice also had a son, Billy, eleven, and a daughter, Georgia, fourteen. Anybody who knew Harvey well could have told Alice that he never even glanced twice at attractive women in his own age bracket, that he was obsessed with teenage girls, and that he often walked into restaurants and approached young girls with invitations and suggestions that were gross and embarrassing. Alice didn't even notice that Harvey seemed to favor Georgia over Billy. When Alice and Harvey were married on April 14, 1972, the new bride really thought she had found herself a prize. He was smart, and he worked hard, and it was nice to have a man around the house again. Her family was not as entranced with Harvey, and her brother, particularly, looked upon him with suspicion. The kids weren't crazy about their new stepfather, either. He was a harsh disciplinarian, and Alice's son was beaten severely several times. Her daughter, Georgia, had other reasons to feel anxious around Harvey. He looked at her, sometimes, in a way that didn't seem fatherly at all. Something about him made her shiver. Just how much Alice knew about Harvey's past has never been established. She knew he'd had some trouble with the law, but she was easily convinced that the police had only been picking on him, making him the scapegoat for things he hadn't done. As far as she was concerned, he was a good husband. He took her on trips to Canada several times. 
She met his mother and stepfather in West Seattle, and Harvey talked of going back to Minnesota sometime so she could meet his half-brother and the rest of the family who lived there. Alice had her own car, and Harvey had several cars. Financially, they were living a very comfortable life. Some second wives-to-be make it a point to visit and talk with a man's first wife and, in so doing, often come away with a whole different view of a man. Alice never considered doing that. She believed Harvey when he said that Sheila had been a nag who never appreciated anything he did. Even if she had attempted to consult with Sheila, it would have been an impossible task. Sheila was in hiding. She, too, was married again and never wanted Harvey to know where she was. She'd seen his temper flare on that day when she'd taken her children swimming, and she hoped, devoutly, that she would never see such blind anger again. All wasn't perfection in Harvey's second marriage. Alice's son had had enough beatings, and he called his real father and told him that he wanted to live with him. Billy was out of the house within months of the marriage. Georgia would have liked to go, too, but she worried about her mother and felt she should stay, confident that she could avoid Harvey's attention. Harvey did have a few eccentricities, but Alice figured that any man who had been single most of his life might be expected to be set in his ways. Harvey was a constant traveler. He put more miles on his vehicles than any man she'd ever known. Harvey had his yellow and black Chevrolet pickup a Pontiac Bonneville sedan, a 1968 Ford Torino, a 1963 Oldsmobile, and a purple Oldsmobile Tornado, and she had the tan 1967 Pontiac. Sometimes Harvey would take her along on his drives, but mostly he'd go alone, and she didn't know where he went. Harvey was a fast driver, and he drove like the hounds of hell were after him. Alice didn't know that he'd gathered tickets like confetti or that he ignored them. Between August 1969 and October 1972, he'd received seven tickets for speeding or for failure to stop. Harvey had been in the penitentiary for most of his adult life and unable to drive. Not surprisingly, he didn't seem to demonstrate either skill or responsibility behind the wheel. He ignored edicts from the Department of Motor Vehicles and subsequently lost his license entirely. Once the honeymoon period was over, Harvey turned out to be a less than perfect husband. When Alice angered him, he belted her across the face and sometimes across the room. On one occasion, it took five stitches to close the gash in Alice's lip. Another time, he blacked her eye and she had to stay away from her family until the discoloration faded. Alice did not consider this reason enough to end the marriage, however. She only vowed to be more careful in the future when she spoke to him, and tried not to nag or argue. Georgia would have welcomed a divorce. She couldn't understand why her stepfather drove off so often at night, and he was always asking her to go for rides with him. On the few times when she could not avoid being in a car with him, she was terrified. The man drove eighty miles an hour on the freeway, darting in and out of traffic as if he were invincible. One evening, Harvey insisted that Georgia go for a ride with him, and there was no way she could get out of it. When they were safely away from the house, her stepfather suggested that she sit closer to him, as he wanted to have a talk with her. He explained that he was jealous when she had boyfriends, but only because he loved her so much. He was only taking a fatherly interest in her welfare. Georgia, much more aware than her mother was, did not find his hand on her leg a fatherly touch. She pleaded with him to turn the car around and take her back home, and he finally agreed. Georgia felt uncomfortable around Harvey, even in her own home. He continued to stare at her so intently that she felt as if she were naked. One evening, when they were alone in the house, Harvey walked across the room toward her without saying a word. Still silent, he picked her up and began to carry her back toward the master bedroom. Georgia beat on her stepfather's shoulders and begged him to consider what he was doing. She asked him what her mother would think if she ever found out. 
Finally, George's words seemed to penetrate the blank stare on Harvey's face, and he set her down and apologized. Not long after, Georgia ran away. She joined her brother and father in California. Things seemed somewhat easier in the Carrignan household once Alice's children were gone. She decided that it might be best, after all, if the youngsters stayed with their father until she and Harvey got their marriage on really solid ground. Chapter 4 on May 23, 1972, Kathy Sue Miller passed from her 14th year into her 15th, only a month after Harvey Carrignan had married Alice Johnson. When Kathy became 15, Mary Miller heaved a figurative sigh of relief. The nightmare had not come true. Now Kathy Miller and Harvey Carrignan lived in Seattle, Indeed, they both lived in the north end of the Emerald City. There was no reason to foresee that they might ever meet. There are a million people living in the Seattle area. On Tuesday, May 1st, 1973, Kathy Miller happened to run her finger down a column of want ads in the Seattle Times' evening edition. She pored over the classifieds, reading each ad in the Help Wanted section. She wasn't looking for a job for herself, but for her boyfriend, Mark Walker. Mark had been looking for a part-time job, and Kathy was trying to help. She didn't need to find a job for herself, because she was pretty sure that she could find work as an aide in a nursing home. In fact, she already had a tentative appointment for the next day at a North End convalescent home. Mary Miller wasn't anxious for Kathy to take a job. There was enough money from Mary's job at the bank, and Kathy had opted to take a heavy class load at Roosevelt High School. She was getting excellent grades, and Mary thought it would be better if Kathy put off getting a job until the summer vacation. And so, when Kathy circled a small ad on Tuesday night, she did so only because the job looked like something Mark would like. Mom, she cried, I think I've found a great job for Mark. Kathy went to the phone and dialed a number. Mary heard no conversation, and then Kathy sighed and hung up the phone. Nobody's there. The gas station must be closed. I'll try again in the morning. At eight the next morning, Kathy tried the number again, and her mother could hear her talking to someone. How old do you have to be? Kathy was asking. Then she exclaimed, Oh, you take girls? Mary was in the next room, getting dressed to go to work, and she could hear her daughter answer yes and no to whatever questions the person on the other end of the line was apparently asking. She heard Kathy give her telephone number and address, and she frowned a little. She would have preferred that Kathy not give out specific information to a perfect stranger. After about ten minutes, Kathy burst into the room. Mom, he asked me all those questions. He practically interviewed me right on the phone. What kind of a job is it? A job at a gas station. He's going to pick me up in front of Sears after school at 2.30 and take me out to the station to fill out an application. Kathy, you don't know anything about cars or pumping gas. And I don't like you meeting a stranger. That isn't right. If you apply for a job, you should go yourself to the place of business. It might be dangerous getting in a car with a man you don't know anything about. Kathy's reaction was that of a typical teenager. Mom, you don't trust anybody. Don't you remember that girl I read about in the paper? The one who was picked up for some job, only it wasn't a real job. She was raped. I don't want you to go. Okay, I won't. But it sounds like it would be a good job. I mean it, Kathy. Don't even think about meeting him. Kathy promised she wouldn't, and Mary left the house to catch her bus. She walked to the corner to wait, but the whole conversation kept coming back to her. She wanted to be absolutely sure that Kathy understood the possible danger. Mary turned around and went back to talk to her daughter again. If she was late, she was late. This was more important than being on time for work. Kathy listened impatiently as Mary stressed again that just because somebody had placed an ad in the paper, that didn't make him automatically all right. And Kathy promised again that she wouldn't go to meet the station owner. 
Mary's bus had gone without her, and she and Kathy now rode the next bus together. Kathy got off first, near Roosevelt High School, and Mary watched through the smudgy window as her beautiful daughter hurried away, turning once to wave happily. Kathy had grown into a lovely young woman. She was tall, five feet seven inches now, and weighed a hundred and forty pounds, a strong athletic girl. Her blonde hair had darkened to a burnished butterscotch color and fell to the middle of her back in thick waves. Kathy had green eyes and just the faintest suggestion of freckles sprinkling over her fair skin. She was very pretty, but she was hardly more than a child, unlike some teenagers, who are fifteen going on forty. Kathy was shy and much more attached to her family than most youngsters. She loved her brother, Kenny, and her black cats and white dog. On that sunny May morning, Kathy wore a blue and white jumper that her grandmother Pergalis had made for her, a navy blue blouse, and blue-tinged nylons. She carried a suede purse and several school books as she walked toward the high school. The bus sped up, and Mary could no longer see Kathy. Mary was still anxious as the bus ascended the I-5 freeway ramp and hurtled south toward the downtown section of Seattle. She had asked Kathy questions during the short time they'd shared the bus ride. Did she know the man's name? No. Where was the gas station? She didn't know. What had the ad said? Only service station help wanted, and a number with an L.A. prefix. That hadn't seemed right to Mary. If the prefix was L.A., the station would have been in the same neighborhood where they lived, some place that Kathy could have reached easily on foot. She wouldn't have needed a ride from the owner. During her morning's work, the job offer kept coming to Mary Miller's mind. The more she thought about it, the more nervous it made her. With a mother's sixth sense, she knew something was wrong. She had to go one step further to be sure Kathy was safe. Mary dialed the Seattle Police Department and was put through to Sergeant Ed Golder, supervisor of the sex crimes unit. She related the facts of the ad and Kathy's phone conversation and asked Golder if it sounded peculiar to him. Yes, he answered. That isn't the way it should be. Tell your daughter not to go. It could be all right, but it's always better to be cautious. I did tell her. That's exactly what I said, that she was not to go under any circumstances. Then it should be okay, Golder replied. If there is any problem, if he calls her or there's anything that worries you, feel free to call me. Mary felt a little better after talking to the police sergeant and thought perhaps she had worried particularly because she and Kathy were still concerned about the man who'd followed Kathy home from the swimming pool the week before. That was probably it and it was ridiculous to think there could be any connection between the man at the pool and the man on the phone. Kathy had called the ad number purely by chance, and the man at the pool might only have been someone headed in the same direction as Kathy. Maybe Mary had warned Kathy too much, made her afraid of shadows. She supposed she would have to get used to men flirting with Kathy. She was so pretty, and she was growing up. With no father at home, Mary had had to play both mother and father, and it had made her doubly vigilant. Well, what of it? She was protective, and that was that. Kathy wasn't home when Mary arrived in the late afternoon. She wasn't particularly concerned because she knew Kathy had thought about going out to the Columbia Lutheran home to see about the aid job after school. It was still light outside and would be for a few more hours. Everything seemed normal. But time passed, and there was no greeting shout from Kathy as she came through the front door. Kenny kept asking where Kathy was, and by six, Mary felt the first niggling of fear. The anxiety of the morning returned. She had to concentrate hard to allay the little darts of fear that made her hands shake. By 6.30... Mary was drawn to the newspaper Kathy had left on the floor the night before. She turned to the classified section and looked for the ad about the gas station job, but the ad wasn't there. 
There was only a hole in the paper where Kathy had torn it out. Mary sent Kenny across the street to borrow last night's times from the neighbors. She scanned the ads and found only one service station job listed that included an L.A. number. Mary carried the paper to the phone and dialed the number given. A man answered. Did you advertise for a job in last night's paper? Mary asked. Yes. Did you happen to talk to a girl named Kathy Miller this morning? Yes, I did. Just a minute. I'll get her slip. Mary heard a female voice in the background, and then the man came back on the line and repeated Mary's own phone number to her. Kathy Miller. Yes, she was supposed to come to the station at 2.45 this afternoon, but she didn't show up. Mary hung up. The man had seemed cooperative, but she was still worried. Kathy had not really disobeyed her. She had promised that she wouldn't get in the car with a strange man. Maybe she had decided to fudge on her promise a little and had taken the bus out to the service station. Or walked. No, the man had said the station was located near 75th and Aurora. That was much too far for Kathy to walk. How had Kathy known where the station was? She hadn't known in the morning. Maybe she'd called the man back and gotten the address. If that was true, why hadn't he mentioned that he'd talked to Kathy twice? He'd only said he'd talked to her in the morning. More worrisome still, why hadn't Kathy appeared for the 2.45 appointment? And where was she now? Mary dialed the phone again. She called Kathy's best friend. Lisa, Mary asked, was Kathy in school today? Did you see her at lunch? I didn't eat lunch with Kathy today, but I saw her at school. She probably went to the library to study at noon, but she definitely was in school. The girl answered. Mary called Mark Walker next, but Mark wasn't home. He was out for the evening at a junior achievement meeting. Then she called another of Kathy's girlfriends and found that that girl was out too. It was eight o'clock now, and the shadows outside had turned from golden to purple. Kathy hadn't come home for supper, and she hadn't called. She always called if she expected to be even fifteen minutes late. Something was wrong. Mary could wait no longer. She dialed 911, the Seattle Police and Fire Emergency Number. She told the operator who answered that she feared something had happened to her daughter. Was it an emergency? Yes, yes. But how could Mary convey to this disembodied voice on the phone that this was Kathy? This was a girl who was always home when she said she would be. The operator took down Mary's name and address and promised to send a patrol car by as soon as one was available. At 9 p.m., a two-man car out of the Wallingford precinct pulled up, and Mary explained the circumstances to the patrolman. I want you to check and find out where that L.A. number is. I called it, and a man answered and said Kathy was supposed to have come there today, but she didn't show up. He told me the station was at 75th and Aurora, but I've looked through the phone book, and I can't find any station listed in that location. The officers promised that they would try to locate the station, but said they might not be able to trace the phone number until the next morning because it was difficult to obtain such traces after working hours at the phone company offices. They could sense this mother's concern, but they were not as worried. The girl was almost sixteen, and it was only nine in the evening, hardly dark yet. They knew that most teenagers break their patterns once in a while. The girl could have met a friend, gone to a movie. There could be a dozen happy reasons why she was late. At 10 p.m., Mary called Mark Walker again. Mark, have you seen Kathy? She hasn't been home from school. Were you with her after school today? Yes, the boy said slowly. She was going to apply for a job. Some man was supposed to pick her up in front of Sears at 2.30. What man? And then, Mary's worst fears seemed to have come true. What man, Mark? I don't know what his name was. He owns a gas station, and he was supposed to pick her up in a purple car. Did you see him? Did she go with him? I don't know. I waited there on the corner with her for as long as I could, and I would have gone with her, but I had my paper route. 
and when he didn't show up in ten minutes, I had to leave. Her fingers trembling, Mary dialed 911 again. She felt she had vital information now, but the operator told her that she would have to wait until the juvenile detectives came on at a quarter to eight the next morning. Determined to find help immediately, Mary called the Wallingford Precinct and asked for a car to come back to her house. About 45 minutes later, another police officer came to her house. He took a report and promised to try to check out the number listed in the ad. But I may not be able to find out anything until morning, he warned, just as the other officers had. The phone company's offices aren't open this time of night. None of the officers reported back that night. Mary paced the floor all night long, hoping against hope that there was a reason that Kathy hadn't come home, a reason other than the awful pictures in her mind. In the morning, Mary called the juvenile unit and talked to Detective Marilyn McLaughlin. McLaughlin said that she would track down the original reports and check out the unlisted phone number. At eleven, McLaughlin called Mary and said that the number had been assigned to a business at 7216 Aurora Avenue North. The owner's name is Harvey Carrignan. Although Mary had spoken to the owner at the station the evening before, Harvey Carrignan was not at the Savemore when Marilyn McLaughlin arrived there. Business was proceeding as usual, and the attendants on duty on Thursday morning said they had never seen a girl who resembled Kathy Miller. None of them knew where their boss was. Carrignan did not appear for work during the day, nor could he be reached at his North End home. When the 4 to 12 second watch shift came on duty, one car was dispatched to Harvey's home, and one car drove to the station. Harvey was located at his home, and he agreed to meet with the officers waiting at the station. He seemed cooperative, quite willing to discuss the matter of Kathy Miller, but he shrugged as he said he couldn't see how he could be of much help. This girl, this Kathy Miller, she was supposed to come out yesterday afternoon, but she never showed up. The investigating patrol officers spoke with a young woman, Candy Erling, who worked at the station. She thought she might have seen Kathy. There was a girl here, only she was here today, not yesterday. She came here in a white Chevrolet, and there was another girl and a guy about nineteen with long hair with her. She was here at three, and she said she needed a job to get money to go to California. What was her name? I don't know. I told her the boss wasn't here, and she'd have to come back when he was. Candy couldn't remember what the girl had worn. The information was relayed to Mary Miller, and she assured the policeman that Kathy didn't know anyone with a white Chevrolet and she didn't want to go to California. We talked about going to New Hampshire this summer to see one of her grandmothers, but not California. If she had wanted to go to California, all she would have had to do was call her uncles down there, and they would have bought her a plane ticket. That couldn't have been Kathy at the station. Up to this point, Kathy had been considered a runaway. Now that the arbitrary 24-hour mark had been passed, the period set by most police departments before they officially declared an individual a missing person. Kathy's name was listed under that category. She's not missing because she wants to be, Mary said firmly. Something's happened to her, or someone is holding her against her will. We have to find her right away. Mary had expected that the police would now go into Harvey Carrignan's gas station and home and search for Kathy. She did not know they were forbidden by the Constitution to do that. They had questioned the man she distrusted so, but that was all they could do. There was no evidence at all to support the contention that Kathy had actually met with Harvey Carrignan, only Kathy's boyfriend's report that she had intended to apply for a job at his service station. That wasn't enough to constitute probable cause, which would allow them to go in and rip the man's property apart. Mary Miller's sister drove slowly by the service station on Aurora and noted two cars there, one a maroon or purple Pontiac, and the other a car that looked to be white over maroon. She took the license numbers. 
Detective McLaughlin ran the license numbers through the Department of Motor Vehicles in the state capital at Olympia. They came back registered to Harvey and his wife, Alice Carrignan. McLaughlin next put in a request for any rap sheet that might be extant on Harvey Lewis Carrignan. In the meantime, Mary was attempting to do detective work on her own. Through bank channels, she was able to do a credit check on Carrignan. He came back clean. Whatever he had done, he had not gotten into financial difficulties recently. It didn't help much to know that. It didn't help at all. Mary felt immensely frustrated when it seemed there was no legal way to force the man to tell the truth. The truth she was sure he was concealing. When she and her sister and brother-in-law drove by the Savemore again, he was not around, nor were any vehicles parked in front of his home. Had she been able to locate Harvey Carrignan, Mary herself would have throttled the truth out of him. Anything to find Kathy before it was too late. Mary called contacts her family had established over the years. The FBI, the chief investigator for the Boeing Airplane Company, and she called the papers, everyone and anyone who might help her break through the system. And then, late on this second day, she took pictures of Kathy into Detective McLaughlin and a small square of fabric, the blue and white cloth left after Mrs. Pergalis had finished making the jumper Kathy had worn. The last glimpse Mary had had of Kathy burned in her mind. Her smiling daughter, dressed in the jumper, walking away from the bus toward her school. Kathy was gone. Simply gone. Swallowed up in a city with half a million people, perhaps into a county with another half million, or perhaps even farther away. There seemed to be no way at all to find her. Mary tried not to think of her nightmare, the dream that was now fifteen years old, and yet it clung to her, flashing across her mind whenever she could not block it. She spent another night without sleep. On Friday morning, May 4th, Mary received a call from detectives in the homicide unit. Kathy's case had been assigned to that division, and that could only mean that they now believed that her daughter had met with foul play. The Nightmare Accelerated Chapter 5 On that Friday morning, May 4th, 1973, Kathy Miller had been missing more than 41 hours. For the first 24 hours, she had been thought to be a runaway. For the next 16, she had been listed officially as a missing person. Hindsight is always keener than trying to guess at the future, and it seems clear now that Kathy should have been considered a victim of foul play from the very beginning. For juvenile detectives, who have dealt with thousands of teenage girls who run away for a day or so, the 24-hour wait rule suffices in almost all cases. However, confrontations with Harvey Carrignan and interviews with Kathy's mother kept pointing to tragedy. When the case was transferred to the homicide unit early Friday morning, police officials were almost certain that Kathy was either dead or held captive somewhere. They would have liked to believe the latter, but sad experience told them that that was probably false optimism. It is a moot point today whether an all-out search would have found Kathy on the evening she disappeared. Probably not. It is clear, though, that there might have been physical evidence still available that could have closed the case cleanly years ago. By the luck of the draw, the next detectives up for major case assignment were Billy Bowman and Dwayne Homan. Homicide detectives always work in teams for pragmatic reasons. At a crime scene, two pairs of hands are essential to gather and label evidence, to take pictures, to hold either end of a tape measure, to chart the scene so that it can be re-established absolutely long after the body is removed. And more than that, two men totally in tune with each other can toss ideas back and forth and evaluate theories in an attempt to solve what sometimes seems, initially, unsolvable. 
1973, there were seven homicide teams, three sergeants, a lieutenant, and a captain working crimes against persons in the Seattle Police Department. The teams were always referred to as if the detectives were literally joined at the hip with their partners, Reed and Dorman, Faunus and Cameron, Moran and Miller, Bowman and Homan. Their names ran together when they were spoken. All in all, fourteen detectives selected to be partners for almost ephemeral reasons, but for reasons that work. Billy Bowman and Dwayne Homan are both solidly built men, who stand well over six feet tall, and they both have brown hair. In one case, when they were searching for a missing five-year-old girl, they worked on it so diligently that they became familiar fixtures in the missing child's home. The victim's younger brother could never distinguish between them and addressed both of them as Bowman. They were both in their mid-thirties in 1973, and both detectives had been in homicide for several years, after working their way up through the ranks. They were, and continue to be, excellent investigators. While Bowman is expansive and something of a joker, Holman tends to be more reflective. They made a solid team, and they worked together with precision, two detectives that no killer would care to have walking behind them. Harvey Carrigan would shortly develop an abiding hatred for Billy Bowman and Dwayne Homan. The Kathy Miller case would haunt Bowman and Homan forever. Each man had a teenage daughter at the time they were given the Miller case. When Dwayne Homan looked at the pictures that Mary Miller had provided, his breath caught and his stomach convulsed. Kathy looked so much like his own daughter that she might have been a twin. The two detectives read through the information that had accumulated since Mary Miller's first call. Kathy had apparently intended to meet Carrigan on a busy street corner in the Roosevelt District at 2.30 on the previous Wednesday afternoon. She had never come home, and Carrigan had steadfastly denied any contact with her at all, beyond a phone call. The patrol officers who had talked to him were not sure if the man had lied. He seemed to be a normal businessman, and he was married. Not the prime suspect for kidnap and whatever else might have occurred, but then both investigators knew that when you deal with homicides, things are seldom what they seem, that most killers have black, hidden sides to their personalities. Had it been up to Holman and Bowman, they would have pulled all stops within minutes of Mary Miller's first call to 911. Their orientation is in the investigation of violent deaths. Homicide men are trained to expect the worst. Each death they probe is looked at first as a possible murder, next as a possible suicide, third as an accident, and only then as a death by natural causes. Homicide detectives are the pessimists of police work. They have to be. By always expecting murder, they can be sure they will not lose physical evidence or good witnesses. If evidence is not retrieved at once from a crime scene, it may well be lost forever. Witnesses tend to scatter, to forget vital information. A crime scene has to be worked meticulously on the first go-round. In this case, they wanted mightily to find some happy reason why Kathy Miller had not come home. But when they looked at Harvey Carrigan's rap sheet, their hearts sank. The suspect had been convicted of murder 23 years earlier and had had the conviction reversed on a technicality, and that murder appeared to have been the result of a thwarted rape. There were three other arrests listed for sexual assault and several for burglary. This man had spent most of his adult life in prison and the rest of it on parole. And this was the person whom Kathy had gone off to meet. Bowman and Homan drove to the bank where Mary Miller worked so that they might interview her. She explained that she couldn't bear to stay home and wait, that every phone call made her jump with a mixture of anticipation and dread. Work provided little salvation, but it helped to pass the hours. The detectives saw a very slim blonde woman, her thick hair pulled into a quignon. Her hands trembled as she lit a cigarette, 
and tried to recall everything she could for them. I remember that she talked to that man for more than ten minutes. I heard her laughing as if someone on the other end of the line was making jokes. From the tone of her voice, I thought it was probably one of her friends. When she hung up, she was so excited, she kept saying, he practically interviewed me right on the phone. She was convinced she could get the job, and I kept warning her not to go, that it didn't seem right to me. Mary Miller thought, like any layman whose child has vanished, that the detectives could now go out and search Harvey Carrigan's property, that they could arrest him. She could tell that they presumed Kathy had met with foul play. Wouldn't that mean that they could search? Wouldn't that mean arrest? They had to explain to her that it didn't. They had no probable cause, nothing concrete, beyond the fact that Kathy had talked to the man on the phone the day she disappeared. The detectives made a list of Kathy's friends' addresses, the names of her relatives, all of the other places she had applied for jobs or intended to apply. Where is Kathy's father? Bowman asked. Is it possible that she would have gone to see him or that he might have taken her away? Mary shook her head. No, he hasn't seen the children since Kathy was three. I believe he's in the Salt Lake City area, but I'm positive he couldn't be involved in this. The detectives tried to reassure Kathy's mother, but it was heavy work. We'll be in touch with you constantly. When we go off duty, other detectives will take over. Billy Bowman handed Mary a card with the number of the homicide unit. Next, the detective pair visited the parole officer who had most recently dealt with Carrigan. He pulled Carrigan's files and nodded. He was under my supervision for a short time in 1971. He was in Walla Walla in the 60s, went up for burglary, 15 years. He was paroled on August 12, 1968. His parole was subsequently revoked on June 30, 1970, and he was back in the joint until February 16, 1971. He continued on parole until July 28, 1972. Since then, he's been on inactive parole. All that means is that he is required to write a letter once a year and report how he's doing. What was your impression of him? Holman asked. He seemed straight, but I found out he had periods of extreme violence. His wife, his ex-wife, was terrified of him. Once in the penitentiary, he beat up a guard, and it took six guards to control him. He spent a year in the hole for that. When things are going right, Harvey's a pretty decent person. But when things aren't going right, he turns into an animal. If you have to arrest him, he'll be dangerous. He won't go easy. When Holman and Bowman went off duty, Detectives Dick Reed and Wayne Dorman took over for the weekend. They touched base first with Mary Miller and let her know they would be in the field looking for Kathy, but that she could reach them by calling radio. Their impression was the same as every other officer's had been. Here was a mother who had had a close bond with her daughter. Reed and Dorman drove to the Savemore station and noted that neither Carrigan's car nor his wife's was parked there and they next found that there were no vehicles outside the Carrigan residence in the north end. The curtains were closed, and there was no activity around the place. It appeared that the Carrignans had taken a trip. Next, the detectives went to the corner of 65th Northeast and Roosevelt, the last place Kathy had been seen. They canvassed every business in the area, asking if anyone remembered a tall, shy girl dressed in blue. No one did. Kathy must have gotten into a car willingly. If she had fought or screamed, surely someone in the busy area would have noticed a commotion. Reed and Dorman checked Ravenna and Cohen Parks, great forested areas close to the Roosevelt District. They knew that they were looking for a body, although neither of them acknowledged that grim fact aloud. Instead, they walked slowly through the wooded parks, poking into piles of brush and working far back into the shadows of the densest thickets. They were vastly relieved when their sweep of the parks netted nothing. They visited the Wallingford Precinct substation and passed out pictures of Kathy Miller to the officers on duty. Now every patrol car in the north end was looking for Kathy. Patrolmen watched for tall, blonde girls, and they saw many, but when they looked more closely, 
they could see that the girls didn't really resemble the girl in the pictures they carried. Dick Reed and Wayne Dorman made another pass by the gas station in Carrigan's home and found that he had not returned. When Homan and Bowman returned to work at 7.30 on Monday morning, Kathy had been missing five days. A confrontation with the suspect would have to be handled very, very carefully. The detectives had read about how he had avoided the gallows on a technicality more than two decades before. Any evidence obtained without probable cause would be considered in court fruit of the poisoned tree, evidence obtained illegally, and therefore tainted and inadmissible. What Homan and Bowman needed was that probable cause to obtain a search warrant, and they did not yet have it. Without a body, or blood, or anything to indicate that Kathy had met with foul play, Harvey was as innocent as a lamb and Harvey knew the rules. He had won before. They talked with Mark Walker, the boy who had walked Kathy to the corner in front of Sears on May 2nd. I met Kathy at 2.35 p.m., just by accident, because she doesn't usually walk that way. I asked her why she was going that way, and she told me she found the job wanting service station help in the want ads. She said she thought it would be a job for me, and she called the number, and the man told her he wanted girls, because he already had boys working for him. She was going to apply for the job. I asked her where the service station was, and she said she didn't know that the guy was picking her up in front of Sears in a purple or wine-colored car. I questioned her about meeting a guy on a street corner to apply for a job. I said that was very unbusinesslike to meet a job applicant like that. She said the guy sounded okay over the phone. Mark looked down at his hands, and his voice was choked as he continued. I told her maybe he was going to pick her up for something other than a job interview. Gee, we both chuckled about it and shrugged it off. Mark explained that he'd had to leave at ten minutes to three, and that neither of them had seen a wine-colored car. I left her there alone. Can you remember what Kathy had on that day? Homan asked. Yes, a blue jumper, blouse, stockings, a waist-length gray jacket. She had an orange plastic notebook, a robin's egg blue notebook, and one school book. But I don't remember which it was. She had a brown purse with a shoulder strap. It had metal chain links holding the strap to the purse. Was Kathy happy at home? Yes, absolutely. She wouldn't have run away. She didn't drink, and she never touched drugs. She was is shy, but she has a lot of friends. And so the probe continued, beginning always with those closest to the alleged victim, asking questions, comparing answers, and then spreading out farther and farther. The man the detectives really wanted to query closely was, of course, Harvey Carrigman, and yet they feared spooking him, and they wanted to avoid that. He was watched covertly, and he continued to follow his normal patterns. When stakeout detectives drove past the Carrigan home on Monday afternoon at 2.30, the drapes were still pulled, but the purplish Toronado was parked in front. They did not stop, but only noted the information. The decision was made to inform the media of Kathy's disappearance, and her picture and description appeared in late Monday and early Tuesday editions of the local papers. Along with a description of Kathy's clothing, the school book and notebooks were mentioned, and a request was made that anyone having information about Kathy should contact Homan or Bowman in the homicide unit. A call came early Tuesday morning, not to detectives, but to Mary Miller. Her phone number was not listed in the telephone directory. The caller had found the number written in the front of a school book. The caller's only intention was to return the books to the owner, and he had no idea of the import of his call to Mary Miller. We have your daughter's books, her algebra book, the caller said. Where are you? Mary asked. Where did you find her things? The caller explained that he was a timekeeper at a business in Everett, some 26 miles north of Seattle. The books had been found in the parking lot of the Everett Plywood Company, a retail firm. 
Mary immediately called Billy Bowman and Dwayne Holman, who had just come on duty, and told them of the find. The detectives left at once for Everett, where the timekeeper of the firm said that the books had been found on Thursday, May 3rd, at 4 a.m., on a ledge abutting the company's parking lot by one of the employees reporting for work. There were an algebra book, a German book, and a social security card in the name of Kathy Miller. We had a group of school children touring through here on Wednesday, the timekeeper said, and we assumed one of them had set the books down and forgotten them. We tried all day Thursday to locate the owner. Then I thought I'd try calling the number I found written in the algebra book. I called and got the mother. Until then, I didn't realize that the girl was missing. Then you didn't see who left the books there? The man shook his head. The books had been found after the school tour had left. He didn't remember any vehicles that had seemed suspicious, but then there was a lot of traffic coming and going at the firm, and no one took special notice of cars in the lot. The plywood firm's parking lot abutted railroad tracks, and there were boxcars waiting for loading on the tracks. Bowman and Bowman crawled into all those boxcars and searched the dark corners inside, thinking that at any moment they would find Kathy. But she wasn't there. Next, they clambered over huge stacks of rough logs piled nearby. A body could have been secreted in the crevices between the jumble of fir trees, and no one would find it for a long time. Billy Bowman, intent on the search, missed his footing and fell heavily from atop the tall stack of logs. He heard a sharp crack and felt a stab of pain in his ankle. He ignored the discomfort and kept searching. By the time the detectives were satisfied that Kathy's body was nowhere in the area of the plywood mill and had returned to Seattle, Bowman's ankle had swollen to three times its normal size. It was broken. Impatiently, he had it cast, and continued on the case. The discovery of Kathy's school books in Everett had told the detectives one thing at least. Someone had taken Kathy and her possessions a long way away from the corner of 65th and Roosevelt. Early the next morning, the detective team drove past the Carrigan home and saw that the pickup truck registered to Harvey was there. The front bumper appeared to be dinged up, and white paint had been spattered over it. Once Kathy's picture had been published in the paper and flashed across television screens, the calls began to pour in. A log was set up in homicide, and each call was noted. Every one of the tipsters was convinced that he had seen Kathy. Hitchhiking, sitting in a restaurant, arguing with a boyfriend, walking along a highway, at the Apple Blossom Festival in Wenatchee, Washington, walking aimlessly along a West Seattle street without a coat against the rain. All of the informants were sure that the girl they had seen looked just like the picture of Kathy. Some of the tips were obviously off the wall, and some sounded possible. The possibilities were followed up, and ended always in disappointment. There were so many pretty teenagers with long blonde hair, but none of them was Kathy. One report was frightening. A woman who lived in the North Seattle suburb of Edmonds said she'd received a phone call about 2 a.m. Saturday that had awakened her from a sound sleep. The man on the line said he'd picked up a girl about 12 who was hitchhiking. He told me that he was allowing the girl one phone call for help, that he was permitting that one phone call because he'd been under psychiatric care and didn't want to do anything to hurt her but he was afraid he might. I dropped the phone because I was still half asleep and because the call frightened me. When I picked it up, the line had gone dead. A sick, obscene call, but nothing to do with Kathy Miller. At five feet, seven inches tall, no one could have mistaken Kathy for a twelve-year-old. There were a lot of calls from mentally unbalanced people, those designated two-twenties, in Seattle police lingo, deranged and occasionally sadistic people who came out of the woodwork when a case is highly publicized. 
One caller claimed that he was holding Kathy Sue Miller and would release her only if $36,000 in unmarked bills was left at a place he would designate in his next call. He never called back. A motorist called to say he'd picked up a young male hitchhiker who had run out of gas. He kept talking about the girl whose picture was in the paper. He said that he could see why someone would want to rape and kill a girl as pretty as that. I told him I didn't want to continue in that vein of conversation, but I decided to find out something about him. He said his name was Howard, and he said he went to school at Everett Community College. He mentioned that Sue Miller's books were found only a mile from his parents' home, but he would never tell me his last name or his address. He asked to be let out in the University District of Seattle, and I was glad to have him out of the car. But then... I got to thinking. By the end of May, the log of calls would include more than a hundred tips, few of them useful. Most of the callers had only wanted to help. Some of them were clearly deranged, and some of them probably only sought the $2,000 reward Kathy's grandparents were offering. One young woman called and said that she had applied for a job at Harvey Carrigan's gas station. The pretty 20-year-old told detectives, that she had gone to the Savemore station at the end of April, and again on the first day of May. She told the detectives that she'd found Harvey less than professional, and that she'd wondered why he'd advertised when he didn't even have a vacancy. I was hired twice, but I never worked there. He told me he didn't have the heart to fire the girl who was working there in April. Then he called me and asked me to come in again. When I got there, he told me I was hired, but then he said he had another reason for calling me. He wanted to take me out to dinner. I told him I wasn't interested. He told me I could stop by anyway and give me a free tank of gas. I did go and get the gas, and he was a perfect gentleman. He didn't mention a date again. It was becoming apparent that Harvey was not the world's most faithful husband. Another woman called after seeing Harvey mentioned in the papers as a possible suspect in Kathy's disappearance. I bought two tires from him. I paid $25 down, and I was to pay the next 25 in a month. When I got the tires, he asked me if I'd like to get both tires for only $25. I asked him what the catch was, and he just grinned and said I knew what it was. I declined the offer and paid the whole $50, but I took his offer as a definite proposition. And with all the calls from the public, most of them useless, there were the expected, urgent messages from psychics or would-be psychics. One woman said that she had received a call from a seer in Florida who had seen Kathy. She says that she can see the letters K.C. and the name Cecil. Her celestial reading shows that the girl is dead, but she wasn't murdered. She drowned. Her body is in seven feet of muddy water near the crew house at the University of Washington. There are bells or chimes playing in the background where she is. The body will float to the surface in one week. At this point, Kathy had vanished so completely that detectives would have been willing to listen to a psychic if she had good information. But the clairvoyants who contacted them were vague and completely off in their information. Kathy's books had been found, but there was no chance of lifting any prints from the book covers. They had been wet from rain when the employee at the plywood firm found them, and he had wiped them dry, unknowingly obliterating any fingerprints that might have been there. Working with the Ninhydrin process, criminalist Carl Jepsen had managed to raise some latent prints from pages inside the books but he could not match them to Harvey Carrigan's prints that were on file from his previous scrapes with the law. Harvey himself was not anxious to talk to the police. <laughs>